wonderful to be here in Vancouver and part of this Life Canada conference and also the gala tonight. Um, what tremendous work you're doing in Canada to spread the pro-life message that everyone is valuable from the very beginnings in the mother's room to the end of the natural life. So I hope that some of what I share both today and tonight will resonate a little bit and maybe give you a deeper perspective of where some of the anti-life attitudes come from and also particularly more tonight, what some of the positive things that science can contribute toward making a pro-life message really powerful, which it is powerful, but communicating to our, our current generation here. So I'll get right in it, actually. Sonia, can you bring me my little pointer? Sorry. Uh, it's my wife, Sonia. We're both here. So, um, yeah, I better have, um, or better two-thirds. Uh, so we're going to start off with this guy. Peter Singer is a professor of bioethics at Princeton University. He's one of today's most notorious proponents of the devaluation of human life. For example, he writes that the life of a newborn baby is of less value than the life of a pig, a dog, or a chimpanzee. Singer's views are well known, at least among those who follow debates over the sanctity of life. But what's less, less well known is, well, where does he get these ideas? Well, in an interview, he told us, all we're doing is catching up with Darwin. He showed that we're simply animals. Humans had imagined we were a separate part of creation, that there was some magical line between us and them. Darwin's theory undermined the foundations of that entire Western way of thinking about the place of our species in the universe. Now, I don't agree with Peter Singer about many things, but I do happen to agree with him here. Darwin's theory did do much to undermine the foundations of the Judeo-Christian view of human beings and their unique place in the universe. Now, Charles Darwin, of course, is best known for developing the theory of evolution by natural selection. Now, according to Darwin's theory, all living things are related by common descent. That is, we're all ultimately descended with modifications from one simple ancestral form. And then his theory further proposes that the evolution of life from single-celled animal to us was driven primarily by natural selection or survival of the fittest. According to modern Darwinian theory, randomly occurring mutations and recombinations of genes uh, produce variations among organisms in a population. Some of these random variations end up helping organisms survive and reproduce more. And so over time, these beneficial variations will come to dominate a population. And it's through this process uh, that we get entirely new biological features and organisms. Now, Darwin's theory may seem innocuous. And I do think that some of the controversy over the theory uh, over the years uh, has been misplaced. For example, uh, I think that a lot of people of faith, at least in America, have been uh, concerned that the evolutionary process took billions of years. I don't happen to think that that is a, a particularly salient or important part of the controversy. But just because some parts of the controversy over Darwinism aren't uh, particularly as, as pressing as people think doesn't mean that others aren't. In fact, Darwinian theory fueled three big ideas that I think have had pretty grave consequences for how our culture's view of human life has been playing out in more recent years. First, Darwin's theory fueled the idea that humans aren't special. According to Darwinism, humans have the same origin as rats and fleas and toadstools, and we aren't fundamentally different from other animals. In fact, Darwinian biologists like to make this point all the time. And if you read my book, Darwin Day in America, you'll see sort of a collection of what uh, Darwinian biologists, how they dis really disdain human uniqueness. So we have biologist Charles Zucker saying that, in essence, humans are nothing but a big fly. Or geneticist Glenn Evans claims that the worm represents a very simple human. Yeah, very simple, you might say. Uh, one science journalist writes that genetics shows that there isn't much difference between mice and men. And the late Gora Morris Goodman from Wayne State University liked to insist that we humans appear as only slightly remodeled chimpanzee-like apes. In the Darwinian view, humans are not unique. We are not special. 
A second big idea that really has been fueled by Darwinian theory is that humanity is the product of a blind, unguided process. As Darwin himself made clear in his writings, natural selection is an unintelligent process that is blind to the future. It can't select new features based on some future goal. It only favors, really, things and traits that are beneficial to survival right now. As a result, evolution by natural selection is the result of an unguided, unplanned process, in the words of 38 Nobel laureates who wrote a statement defending and championing Darwinian theory in 2005. Darwinian evolution is the result of an unguided, unplanned process. So according to Darwinian theory, amazing biological features, such as the human eye, or the wings of butterflies, or the blood clotting system, are in no way the purposeful result of evolution. Rather, they are the unintended result, uh, byproducts of chance and necessity. The same holds true for higher animals, such as human beings. In the words of the late paleontologist at Harvard, George Gaylord Simpson, man is the result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have him in mind. In the Darwinian worldview, you and I are accidents of natural history, not the purposeful creations of a loving creator. The third big idea, funded and funded, <coughs> fueled by Darwin's theory, is that the great engine of progress in the history of life has been mass death. Instead of believing that the remarkable features of humans and other living things reflect the intelligent design of a master artisan, Darwin portrayed death and destruction as our ultimate creator, as he wrote at the end of his most famous work on the origin of species. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. Just think about that. Death is our creator. Death, evil, destruction, things that for most of human history, people have regarded as bad things. That is the author of the best things in nature. Ideas have consequences, and these three big art Darwinian fueled ideas have had momentous consequences for cultural struggles over the sanctity of life, both in the past and today. This afternoon, I'd like to explore the impact of Darwin's ideas on just three areas, scientific racism, eugenics, and abortion. Darwin was not the world's first racist, but his theory without question exerted a powerful influence on the development and growth of a scientific version of racism. As Harvard uh, evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould admitted, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1859 when On the Origin of Species came out, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. Now, why is this? Well, Darwin thought that his theory of natural selection provided a scientific explanation for why races should be expected to have unequal capacities and why there were higher and lower races. What trait an animal needs to survive is going to differ, after all, based on the animal's environment. So in Darwin's view, there's no reason to expect that natural selection acting on random variations in different populations facing different survival needs is going to produce the same traits in every population. Indeed, according to Darwin's theory, we should expect significant differences in the capacities of different populations, and in this case, different races. Accordingly, in Darwin's book, The Descent of Man, he declared that there were significant differences in the mental faculties of what he called men of distinct races. Darwin also argued that the break in evolutionary history between apes and humans came between, this is his words, between the Negro or Australian, and he meant Australian Aborigine, and the gorilla, thus depicting blacks as the closest human beings to apes. Darwin's supporters further popularized these ideas. Renowned German scientist Ernst Haeckel, for example, was a friend and correspondent with Darwin and one of the most celebrated champions of Darwin's theory in Germany in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Heckel created this widely disseminated, actually, this uh, widely disseminated diagram of human evolution. 
Note, actually, we don't have a lot of time to discuss this particular one, but note, let's see if I can get this, uh, at the top you have sort of the Aryan Nordic male, at the bottom you have, oh, okay, <laughs> ape-like creatures, and note here, and this was the takeaway point for Heckel, the gap between the highest, what he considered the highest human, and the lowest human, is far larger than the step between the highest ape and the lowest human. That was the takeaway from uh, this diagram that was reprinted in textbooks around the world, basically, including in North America. Now, in North America, uh, we also had many similar uh, racial ideas grounded in Darwinian biology. Uh, some of it was popularizing Heckel's views, some Darwin's views, some was homegrown. One of the results was the creation of what modern scholars have liked to call human zoos, or the public exhibition of indigenous peoples as lower stages of evolution, or missing links between humans and apes. Uh, I just finished a documentary on this called Human Zoos, and I'd like to show a couple of uh, snippets from that to show you how this played out. So sometimes these exhibitions were being done by promoters outside the scientific community, and here's a clip that sort of talks about some of that. The year was 1859, three months after Charles Darwin published his book On the Origin of Species. American promoter P.T. Barnum unveiled a new attraction at his popular museum in New York City. It featured what was described as the what is it, or man monkey. Visitors were told that the creature had been captured by hunters in Africa, who discovered a race of beings roving among the trees and branches like apes and monkeys. Museum staff declared that the creature had been pronounced by scientists as a connecting link between African blacks and lower animals. In reality, Barnum's so-called man monkey was an African-American man named William Henry Johnson. Thanks to Barnum, Johnson spent much of his life on public display as an evolutionary missing link, sometimes in a cage. Many reporters at the time were happy to promote the deception. The New York Tribune declared that Barnum's performer seemed to be a cross between an ape species and a Negro, while another paper declared, the head is shaped like that of a monkey but the face is more like that of an African Negro of the lower order. It has been pronounced by naturalists as a specimen of the connecting link between man and monkey. Many more supposed missing links were marketed to the public at freak shows throughout America. In the 1880s, there was Crow, promoted as living proof of Darwin's theory of the descent of man. She was described as a perfect specimen of the step between man and monkey. Actually, Crow was a young woman from Southeast Asia who suffered from hypertrichosis, a rare genetic condition that produces excessive hair. In the early 1900s, there was Congo, the ape man, usually exhibited in a cage next to a chimpanzee. Most of these early presentations of missing links were crude hoaxes put forward by hucksters, not scientists. But the quest to dramatize the lower stages of human evolution eventually reached far beyond freak shows. It ultimately involved the most elite members of the scientific community, and it was given a platform at one of the most celebrated events in early 20th century America. So, as I said, sometimes the presentation of these human zoos were done by freak show promoters, charlatans, but as time went on, many of them were done by leading scientists, and the most largest and extensive human zoo presentation uh, in the United States took place at the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904, where thousands of indigenous peoples were imported by anthropologists and biologists, uh, leading anthropologists and biologists of the United States, to be put on public display, not in cages, but they were put, fences were put around them, and they were portrayed in terms of that these are lower, people lower on the evolutionary, you know, uh, platform than, than whites. And in fact, they included a group of Africans who were uh, pygmies from the African Congo. And here's another clip from Human Zoos that shows how these Africans were presented to the public. It's done in the style of the newsreel, uh, which 
was recreated was created for the documentary. But the actual words you're hearing and and what you're seeing uh, are is coming from an actual newspaper article published at the time. So the words are the words of a newspaper article that was published at the time of the St. Louis World's Fair. This is how they portrayed this presentation. Will the pygmies brought last week to the World's Fair prove Darwin's theory of the missing link? Will a study of the little black children of the African jungles shed light on the theory evolved by Darwin as regards the evolution of the human race? Dr. W.J. McGee, chief of the anthropology department of the World's Fair, is convinced that it will. This is the first time that the aboriginal people of Africa have been brought to an English-speaking country. This is the first opportunity that has been presented to scientists to study them. Many characteristics were noticed in the pygmies that closely resemble the ape or the simian type. It is believed that the pygmies, who are said to represent the lowest form of human development, are next removed from the simian family. So the idea that non-white races represented a throwback to lower stages of the evolutionary process was held throughout the scientific community in the early 20th century in both Europe and in North America. Consider the views of biologist Charles Davenport. Davenport is regarded as one of the founding fathers of the discipline of genetics. He taught at Harvard, at the University of Chicago. He was a member of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States. He founded a research lab at Cold Spring Harbor, which is still one of the world's premier biological research organizations. Davenport was obsessed with the idea that some races were still stuck back in lower evolutionary stages. As he put it, it seems probable that in the same country we have living side by side, persons of advanced mentality, persons who have inherited the mentality of their ancestors of the early Stone Age, and persons of intermediate evolutionary stages. Now, fortunately, most of the scientific community has moved beyond these views, but not everyone. Uh, this man, does anyone know who he is? Nobel Prize winner. Uh, James Watson, co-discoverer with Francis Crick of the structure of DNA. In 2007, not that long ago, basically a decade ago, he sparked an uproar by suggesting that African blacks are biologically inferior to whites. Why? Well, if you actually read his book at the time and, and listened to what he had to say, he argued that human evolution was the explanation for this because, again, if you have natural selection acting on different populations with different survival needs, and that's our creator, why should you expect different human races growing up in different areas of the world to have similar capacities? Again, fortunately, this view has largely been discredited in the mainstream scientific community, unlike a century ago. Unfortunately, in America, at least, there are a growing number of white supremacists who are resurrecting these exact same ideas, sometimes citing the work of evolutionary biologists from the early 20th century uh, in what is often called the alt-right or the so-called alt-right and that also is covered uh, in my new documentary. The recent resurgence of white supremacist groups in America has raised chilling echoes of the past. Evolutionary arguments for racism that were rejected by the scientific community are now being resurrected by modern racists. In 2009, white supremacist James Von Brunn drove to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., where he fatally shot an African-American security guard. Von Brunn had published a manifesto arguing that cross-breeding whites with species lower on the evolutionary scale diminishes the white gene pool while increasing the number of mongrels. Richard Spencer is a leader of the so-called alt-right. He argues that, quote, Darwinism offers a compelling and rational justification for whites to act on behalf of their ancestors and progeny and feel a shared sense of destiny with their extended kin group." Unquote. In a 2017 study, more than 400 self-identified members of the alt-right revealed that they view blacks, Mexicans, and other racial and ethnic groups as less evolved 
and closer to humans' ape-like ancestors than whites. The misuse of science to promote racism is no longer just a sad relic of our history. It's also an uncomfortable part of our present. Okay, again, uh, fortunately, I think in America, this is still sort of obviously a minority. But scientific racism isn't the only idea impacting uh, the sanctity of human life that Darwinian ideas helped shape. Darwinian theory played an even more critical role in the development of the scientific crusade that became known as eugenics. Eugenics was described by its proponents as the self-direction of human evolution. The inspiration for the movement came straight from Darwin's theory. Remember that in Darwin's view, the only reason that humans develop their outstanding capabilities is not because they were designed that way by a loving creator, but because natural selection or survival of the fittest ruthlessly weeded out the unfit. But now civilized societies do their best to care for those who nature would have killed off. That, in a Darwinian view, sets us up for disaster. Here's what Darwin himself wrote about the problem in his book, The Descent of Man. We civilized men do our utmost to check the process of elimination. We build asylums for the imbecile, the maimed and the sick. We institute poor laws. And our medical men exert their utmost skill to save the life of everyone to the last moment. There is reason to believe that vaccination has preserved thousands who from a weak constitution would formerly have succumbed to smallpox. No one who has attended to the breeding of domestic animals would doubt that this must be highly injurious to the race of man. Hardly anyone is so ignorant as to allow his worst animals to breed. Hardly anyone is so ignorant to allow his worst animals to breed. Now, Darwin was a kindly man, and so he was ambivalent about the implications of his theory when it came to getting rid of the so-called unfit. Likewise, many of his followers thought it would be too cruel just to go back to the law of the jungle and eradicate people. So they thought it would be more compassionate for humans to use science to reinstitute something like natural selection but using human reason. That became the rationale for eugenics. Charles Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, is generally recognized as the official founder of eugenics. And he actually coined the term, adapted from a Greek word meaning good in birth. Positive eugenics uh, became known as focused on encouraging the best uh, to breed more, while negative eugenics, which really was largely the focus of public policy, was curtailing reproduction by those deemed unfit, including mental defectives, criminals, and a whole host of other people. As I noted, eugenics drop, drew pretty direct inspiration from Darwinian biology. That was its whole rationale, even from the writings of Darwin himself. Yet today, the Darwinian roots of eugenics are largely covered up. Uh, just two brief examples. Uh, there's a website called Understanding Evolution that our National Academy of Sciences in the United States set up, paid for, to teach teachers how to teach about the history and, and meaning of evolution. And in one part of it, it has a section on Darwin and social Darwinism. And they have this graphic which sort of summarizes what they're teaching the teachers to teach. There they have Mr. Darwin with a cane uh, saying, get out of my house, to Mr. Laissez-faire capitalism, and then Mr. Eugenics. So the idea is that Darwin, and particularly in this case, eugenics, <coughs> no real relation. And in fact, Darwin would have been horrified by eugenics. Well, in fact, that's not the case, as I've just uh, indicated. But that's in the United States. This is one of the key resources we use to teach science teachers to teach kids about the history of this. Um, here's another case that is actually even more stunning. Uh, if I have time, I'll go into this a little more, but our most infamous case of forced sterilization, which was done on behalf of eugenics, was of a lady named uh, Carrie Buck, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and we may have time to discuss. But, and it, it, it issued a Supreme Court ruling in Buck versus Bell that basically said it was constitutional for eugenics reasons to uh, compulsorily sterilize people in the United States, uh, a ruling that has not actually ever been overruled by our Supreme Court. And so this was on the 75th anniversary of it, and this was again a, a well-reputed site. Uh, the 
uh, Dolan, Dolan, I think, uh, DNA uh, Learning Laboratory. It's used to teach teachers about the history of things like eugenics. And this article uh, talks about it, and, but you might ask, well, where did this idea of eugenics come from? Well, there's only one line in the article about that, and here's where they attribute eugenics. It was based on the biblical concept that like breeds like, to which eugenics researchers provided a scientific gloss. No mention of Darwin, no mention of natural selection, but we all know that all bad things come from the Bible. So it was, now I will tell you that uh, historically, the eugenics people were not citing the Bible on the whole to defend eugenics. They were citing natural selection. Here's just uh, some of the things from the literature, from the original source literature. You'll find all this documented in my book, Darwin Day in America. Time and again, American eugenists lamented that we were sinning against the law of natural selection. Take Edwin Conklin, professor of biology at Princeton University, an eventual head of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Conklin argued that while nature may still kill off the worst defectives, nevertheless, a good many defectives survive in modern society and are capable of reproduction who would have perished in more primitive society before reaching maturity. Thus, natural selection, the great law of evolution and progress, is set at naught. Harvard geneticist Edward East had similar views. A member of the elite National Academy of Sciences and president of the American Society of Naturalists, East wrote that, Eugenic tenets are strict corollaries of the theory of organic evolution. Nature eliminates the unfit and preserves the fit. Her fool-killing devices were highly efficient in the olden days before civilization came to thwart her. It is man, not nature, who has caused all the trouble. He has put his whole soul to saving the unfit and has timidly failed to do the other half of his duty by preventing them from perpetuating their traits. Then there was Professor H.E. Jordan, head of the medical school at University of Virginia. He argued, What sanitary science and hygiene seek to accomplish by attention to external conditions alone largely defeats its own ends by counteracting the working of the principle of selection. According to eugenists, human beings were essentially no different than horses, hogs, or blackberries, and so the techniques used to perfect or breed animals and plants could easily be applied to men and women with just as much success. So uh, Charles Davenport, again, a uh, leading biologist from the National Academy of Sciences, said, Man is an animal, and the laws of improvement of corn and of racehorses hold true for him also. According to inventor and eugenist Alexander Graham Bell, the laws of heredity which apply to animals also apply to man. Therefore, the breeder of animals is fitted to guide public opinion on questions relating to human heredity. The underlying assumption here of the eugenists was a really thoroughgoing biological reductionism. In their view, social problems like poverty or unemployment were rooted in man's biology rather than his environment or his choices. The eugenists had blind faith in modern science that led to a sort of utopianism dressed up in quasi-religious rhetoric. Uh, they promised to create heaven on earth through the magic of human breeding. The Garden of Eden is not in the past, it's in the future, promised one eugenist. Confident that Darwinian biology had revealed to them how to breed a better race, eugenists set about turning their ideas into action. Uh, the impact on public policy was far-ranging, including laws on who could marry, immigration restrictions on races considered lower on the evolutionary scale, and forced sterilization of those considered less fit in Darwinian terms. By the 1920s, eugenists marketed sterilization, in fact, as the solution of choice to what they depicted as a looming welfare crisis. Uh, so in 1926, we have this speech at uh, Vassar College promoting sterilization by Margaret Sanger, a eugenist and uh, obviously the, the founder of Planned Parenthood. Here is, it's recreated by an actress, but here are her actual words in this graduation speech. And imagine being a young woman and you know, this is what you're being taught in 1926. 
In 1923, over nine billions of dollars were spent on state and federal charities for the care and maintenance and perpetuation of these undesirables. Year by year, their numbers are mounting. Year by year, their cost is increasing. Huge sums, yes, vast fortunes are expended on these, while the normal parents and their children are compelled to shift for themselves and compete with each other. The American public is taxed heavily taxed to maintain an increasing race of morons, which threatens the very foundations of our civilization. Our eyes should be opened to the terrific cost to the community of this dead weight of human waste. And this isn't just cherry picking from Margaret Sanger, if those of you who have read her writings, or the eugenists. This is how they talked about fellow human beings. And in fact, they pretty much dehumanized anyone who didn't measure up and as, as subhuman. And we can sort of see this, uh, this is, was a eugenics propaganda photo. Uh, you may not be able to see all of it, but basically they got together a group of people, I think this was actually on Wall Street in New York, uh, and put signs in there to hold up, basically saying, you know, I can't read this sign, so why should I be able to you know, have children? Uh, I mean, just a very demeaning, imagine that, rounding up people who might not even be able to read the signs and having them hold things that basically say that they should be subject to sterilization. What kind of view of human being does it take to do that? Uh, and then again, in their writings, this is how they talked about people, according to Charles Davenport, uh, the feeble-minded or people who didn't measure up uh, represented animalistic strains from earlier stages of evolution uh, and, you know, that's how he talked about it. Plant breeder Luther Burbank reportedly made the same comparison, and he said, nature eliminates the weeds, but we turn them into parasites and allow them to reproduce. Referring to people as weeds or parasites. Harvard biologist Edward East talked about the parasitic fraction of the population, saying they were like a cancerous growth on the issues of society. And then here's also what he said. One of our prominent social workers is quoted as saying that Every child is worth $5,000 to society. Stuff and nonsense. Some of them are not worth 5,000 Soviet rubles. They are liabilities, not assets. Others are worth golden millions. If prosperity is to be promoted, the assets should be increased and the liabilities reduced. Talking about human beings. They attack traditional charity as being bad because it was based on ideals of humanitarianism and human equality. Margaret Sanger, in fact, warned of, quote, the dangers inherent in the very idea of humanitarianism and altruism. Dangers which have today produced their full harvest of human waste, of inequality and inefficiency. That altruism itself was considered dangerous and evil. Uh, during the Great Depression, some eugenists even championed sterilization as the solution to the unemployment problem, which they blamed as really due to not economic factors, but unlimited procreation by defectives. Uh, by 1940, almost 36,000 men and women had been sterilized in public institutions across the United States. Uh, by the 1960s, it had gone up to 60,000. All told, most government-sponsored sterilizations in the United States uh, took place, at, they were targeting people they called feeble-minded an expansive and slippery category defined largely by prejudice. So these were photos used, I think, in South Carolina, or it was North Carolina, by their sterilization boards to promote, well, see, we're just targeting people who are really out of it. Uh, and so you know, they, you could, they sort of stage these photos. Uh, look at the second one. What what's, would have been, if you were in South Carolina, what's so disturbing about that? They look perfectly normal. It's because uh, it looks like it's a mixed race child. And of course, they were playing up uh, racial fears. The, the strange thing is that really most people don't realize is that the category of feeble-minded, which was a scientific category at the time, included far more than those who would just be considered mentally handicapped today. In fact, to the untrained observer, many so-called feeble-minded persons would seem perfectly normal. They could read, they could work, they could function and do the tasks that everyone else does. That was the problem, according to the Darwinian biologists. The feeble-minded 
looked like normal people. And so you might marry them by mistake, spreading their defective genes to the next generation. The feeble-minded were actually more dangerous than those obviously mentally handicapped or, or institutionalized because they could seem so normal. Perhaps the most infamous case of the slipshod way in which people were labeled feeble-minded and selected for sterilization was the case of Carrie Buck, which I referred to earlier. Carrie Buck seemed destined for a life of heartache. Born to parents who were regarded as unfit, she was placed in a foster home at age four. By the time she was 10, her parents had divorced and her mother was labeled mentally defective and incarcerated in the Virginia colony for epileptics and feeble-minded. One can only imagine how Carrie felt about the social stigma of her family background. However, she made the best of her circumstances. She performed well in school, at least for the five grades she had the opportunity to attend and she attended church and sang in the church choir. Then came the terrible summer of 1923, which would change the rest of her life. At age 17, she was raped and became pregnant by the nephew of her foster parents. Apparently wishing to cover up the crime, the foster parents had Carrie committed to the Virginia colony for the feeble-minded, and Carrie's newborn daughter, Vivian, was put in a foster home. The board of the colony quickly decided that Carrie Buck should be sterilized under Virginia's newly enacted sterilization law. In the view of the state's experts, Carrie Buck was a link in three generations of hereditary defectives, despite her own good record in school. Carrie's mother, Emma, was supposed to be feeble-minded. Carrie herself was feeble-minded, according to an expert who did not even meet her. And now her daughter Vivian was supposed to be subnormal, according to an infant IQ test administered by another medical expert. Science therefore dictated that Carrie Buck be sterilized, removing her defective germ plasm from the population. Carrie disagreed and challenged the sterilization order in court. By the time Buck v. Bell reached the U.S. Supreme Court, the record was so skewed against Carrie that it might have been difficult for the justices to rule in her favor even had they been sympathetic. But most of them probably were not sympathetic. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who wrote the opinion in the case, was a thoroughgoing Darwinist who believed society's only hope for wholesale regeneration lay in restricting propagation by the undesirables and putting to death infants that didn't pass the examination. Holmes not only upheld Carey's operation, he lauded the wisdom of compulsory sterilization, opining that it's better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring from crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. He ended with a declaration that remains one of the most chilling statements penned by a Supreme Court justice three generations of imbeciles are enough. By the time Carrie uh, of her death in the early 1980s, she was no longer considered mentally handicapped. She was said to be an avid reader. Uh, she wrote perfectly coherent letters. She married, joined uh, the Methodist Church, uh, returned to singing in the church choir. Uh, she was not considered mentally handicapped. But at this time when the eugenics was, was really in its heyday, they were categorizing people for all sorts of reasons as feeble-minded, and in fact, if you looked okay, that might actually be used as a presumption against you. Uh, Canada also passed eugenics-based sterilization laws, although there weren't quite as many people sterilized in Canada as in the United States. And as bad as the impact of eugenics was in North America, by far the most horrific impact of the eugenics crusade was in Nazi Germany, where under the Nazis, hundreds of thousands of people were sterilized in the name of eugenics and then an estimated quarter million disabled people were murdered, many in gas chambers dressed up as shower stalls. Indeed, it was during the killing of the handicapped, which took place in the first years of the Holocaust, that, uh, in the name of eugenics, that the Nazis perfected some of the methods they then used to murder millions of Jews. And how did the Nazis justify these sterilizations? Well, here's a clip from one of the many films they created to sell their killing program to the German public. Here's Here's what the German public learned. Alles Leben.
Lebensschwache geht in der Natur unfehlbar zugrunde. Wir Menschen haben gegen dieses Gesetz der natürlichen Auslese in den letzten Jahrzehnten furchtbar gesündigt. Wir haben unwertes Leben nicht nur erhalten, wir haben ihm auch Vermehrung gewährt. Die Nachkommen dieser Kranken sahen so aus. Sinned against the law of natural selection. Now, this is undeniably grim, but it's also ancient history for most people. So, um, tonight I'm actually going to talk more about some more recent history, but let me just here, before uh, closing, uh, just mention that there was an impact on abortion, and it actually goes back again to Ernst Haeckel, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit tonight. Uh, but many of the arguments, early arguments for abortion by scientists and doctors did draw on some Darwinian understanding of what was happening in our womb. And uh, these have been promoted even today. This is actually Alexander Sanger, grandson of Margaret Sanger, wrote a book in 2004 where he also made some evolutionary arguments for abortion. Uh, again, I'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. Uh, it also is having a lot of impact today on the animal rights movement and on, on people who think that humans are not valuable. And I'll just do one side of that now before wrapping up, because again, I'll be talking a little bit more about that tonight. Uh, this man is named Eric Pianca. He's an evolutionary zoologist at the University of Texas, one of America's leading research universities. As an orthodox Darwinist, Dr. Pianca stresses that human beings are no more important than lizards or any other animal. Indeed, he thinks that humans are a blight on the earth because they're producing so many people. He recommends eliminating up to 90% of the world's human population and calls on the American government to confiscate all the earnings of any couple who has more than two children. Darwinian theory has consequences for our society's view of humanity even today. So, why, though, is this broader history that I've been talking about, why do I think it's important for today? Well, I think there are several reasons. First, truth is its own reason. It's worth knowing the truth, uh, even if it doesn't have a, a lot of practical implications. I think it, this does, but I think you know, knowing the truth is important. Second, though, I think history matters. Our judgments about the present are dictated in part by our background knowledge of the past. So it's helpful to know where we've failed in the past because it can alert us to problems that might recur, like the, the alt-right to them. People can gain wisdom from knowing the history of current controversies. Third, and more specifically, I think we need to know that it's okay to question science. The history of social Darwinism is a cautionary tale about how science by the best and brightest, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Columbia, um, how science can be abused and frankly sometimes flat wrong. Eugenics was the consensus view of the scientific community for decades, both in North America and in Europe, by the top scientists. But they can be wrong. During the eugenics movement, the strongest, most vocal opposition to eugenics came from committed Catholics. But they were poo-pooed by leading scientists and accused of being anti-science, because they were just trying to impose their religion on people. Some of the arguments made today in the life movement were pioneered by the eugenics movement against people who were against eugenics. Yet in the light of history, I think it's pretty clear we would have been all better off had we listened to the Catholic priest and laity who were raising critical questions about eugenics, not to the scientific consensus of the time. So when we hear claims made in the name of science today, whether it be about embryonic stem cell research or the supposed need for fetal body parts or something else, it's helpful for people to know that those who speak for science are not infallible and that it's okay to raise questions. Finally, knowing about the cultural impact of Darwinian theory on life can give us insight into how to challenge the assault on human life in our culture. And I'll be talking more about that on the positive side tonight, but I just want to give a little glimmer here. If you understand how Darwinian theory has been one of the major influences encouraging the devaluation of life in our culture, you'll also understand why we can't ignore the claims of Darwinian biology. Darwinian ideas that humans are just animals and that they we're the products of a blind process that didn't have us in mind lead to a culture of death, not life. The good news is that over the past two decades, there have been a resurgence of serious scientists and philosophers at the highest levels raising scientific challenges to unguided Darwinian theory. Here's just one example, and, and he's uh, actually, 
he's a physicist, Nobel Prize winner, Robert Laughlin, not even a person of faith. But here he frankly states, evolution by natural selection has lately come to function more as an anti-theory, called upon to cover up embarrassing experimental shortcomings and legitimized findings that are at best questionable and at worst not even wrong. Stanford physicist, Nobel laureate. That's on the negative side. But on the positive side, new findings from biology, chemistry, physics, and related fields have provided powerful evidence that we live in a purposeful universe and that humans do indeed occupy a special place in nature. Again, I'm going to talk more about that tonight, but just one glimmer of that. You know, inside each of us, each of you, inside each of you, are 37 trillion cells. And inside each of those cells is a software code more sophisticated and powerful than any devised by man. It's called DNA. According to Microsoft founder Bill Gates, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software we've ever created. DNA is described by scientists as an information code, as the language of life. But in our uniform and repeated experience, the basis of empirical science, Software requires a programmer. The 19th century Darwinian idea that you can magically produce new features through a mechanistic and non-intelligent process of chance and necessity flies in the face of the existence of the software code at the basis of life. Where did that information embedded in our DNA come from? As my colleague, philosopher of science, Stephen Meyer points out, the creation of information is the hallmark of mind. Again, a software program requires a software programmer. I ended my latest documentary, Human Zoos, with a famous statement from philosopher George Santayana, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. But the point of my talk this afternoon is a little more hopeful. It's those who do remember the past have the capacity to change the future. By telling the truth about the misuse of science and about the growing evidence that we're the result of purpose, we can rebuild a culture of life where each life is respected and cherished. <laughs>